You've been sitting a long time and being blessed. Why don't you just stand up? Just stand up. I don't want you to sleep while I'm... <laughs> just stand there. <laughs> I've always had a thing about people sleeping in church. Um, I say, well, you know, it's awful to watch them. Have you ever watched them? You can see them from up here. And <laughs> they start to go to sleep, you know, they go like this, you know, and then they... And it's terrible, really. <laughs> and they don't get anything out of their nap because they keep trying to wake up. And they don't get anything out of the sermon. <laughs> so I say, just go ahead to sleep and get something. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can sit down. <clears throat> My first pastor it was a small church in New Hampshire, about three miles from the Canadian border. It was a congregational church, but they had had a little uh, old maiden lady with her hair in the back of her head, just a perfect picture of, of a little old maiden lady. And uh, she had pastored there for 25 years and preached the gospel. And there was no other congregational church in the area that preached the gospel. They preached everything but... So when she left, they asked the Christian Missionary Alliance if they'd send someone, and uh, I got sent. And so it was a very interesting situation, and of course I preached the gospel there. But I got married, and I got bronchitis. The winters are cold in the mountains of New Hampshire. And I got bronchitis very, very bad. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody with it bad, but mine was bad. <laughs> I had to sit up in a chair to sleep at night because I couldn't lay down. I was coughing so bad, and I couldn't keep anything on my stomach, and I was very, very ill. Now, uh, there was no doctor in the community, and if there had been, I don't know if he could have done anything. That was before penicillin and all those wonderful things. Now, that tells how old I am, but it's a long time ago. And... Uh, Sunday was coming. There's nobody uh, to fill the pulpit. If I didn't preach, that was it. And you couldn't get anybody. The nearest church that preached the gospel was 50 miles north in Sherbrooke, Canada. And so it was me or nothing. And I was really sick. <laughs> so I asked the board members if they would come and anoint and pray for me. Now they'd never, ever done that. I don't know if they'd ever even heard of it. And I still remember a gentleman that had the little bottle of olive oil to anoint me, and his hand was shaking so bad, I was afraid he was going to spill it, because he'd, he'd never done this. So I thought, well, I've got to get healed before Sunday. I have to. I mean, <laughs> we're going to be in bad trouble. So they anointed me and prayed for me, and uh, I didn't get any better. I worked on a sermon, I got it ready, I came and sat in the front of the church, and one of the men led the service, and I'm, I don't know how he did, I'm sitting there coughing, 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 coughing. And I said, well, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen now, uh, <laughs> we'll see. So it was time for me to preach, and I took my Bible, I walked up and laid it on there, and started in. And it was perfect. <laughs> no cough, no problem, no weakness, no sickness, nothing. <laughs> wow. And I preached the whole sermon, and I thought, God has healed me. Isn't that great? And I preached the whole sermon and finished and went and sat down and started coughing like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> God didn't say anything. So I went, I thought I'll surely get well during the next week. I mean, come on. So I go through the week, not a bit better, not even a little better, just terrible. I just married my poor wife, thought I was going to die and leave her up there in the mountains of New Hampshire. <laughs> and I come up to the next Sunday and here I am, the same thing, and I'm sitting there coughing. I was right over on this side, so watch out. That's <laughs> And then I went up to preach. As soon as I opened the Bible, bing, total freedom, 
complete strength, preached the whole sermon, no problem, went and sat down, and started coughing again. <laughs> and then slowly, during the next week, I started to get better. I said, God, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't understand this. Why did you make me go through that? Why didn't, I mean, you did something very special. And God started to speak to me and say, I want you to understand right up front at the beginning of your ministry that I don't need you to be anything. All you need is me. You just need me. I can use you if you're sick. I can use you if you're well. I can use you if you can't speak. I can do it. That began to change my life before I even got started. I said, this is something. God is enough. He is enough. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Is God enough? Is he really enough, or do we need this and that besides him? And you know, it's been the experience of over 60 years that God has done that for me again and again and again. Why? Because he is able to do it. Amen? amen. You can say amen. I, it's a Nazarene church, isn't it? <laughs> 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 you know, there are some of us folks that still know how to say amen. <laughs> how does that, you say, well, that's fine. It's a nice story that happened to you way back there. How does that affect us today? What does that have to do with us ministering for Christ today? Well, it has everything to do with it. Clergy breakdown in the Western world is now epidemic. In North America, men and women are leaving the professional ministry at the rate of 1,500 a month. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> they are leaving the ministry at the rate of 1,500 a month. They are breaking down physically, mentally, morally, and spiritually. Now, why? Well, there are a number of reasons, but I believe there is primarily one reason. And I want you to really get this this morning, whether you don't have to be in the professional ministry to get this. I believe it is because they are trying to do what only God can do. People in the ministry and people out of the ministry and people in the churches are trying and trying and trying to make the church go, to make the church grow, to see people come to Christ, and they're trying to do what only God can do. And it will kill you. <laughs> now, God can, uh, God can give up on me. I've always told him he could shut my mouth whenever he got ready, so he could do that this morning. But I'm 83 years old, and I've been in the ministry for 63 years, and I want you to know that God can do it. And I, you know, in a way, I'm tickled you young people are here this morning, because if you get this, it'll absolutely transform your life, and you'll go all over the world preaching the gospel and bringing people to Christ. And nothing can stop you. Jesus said, I will build my church. Did you know that was in the Bible? <laughs> Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, I've lived through all the church fads for <laughs> years. And uh, the church growth was one of them. It's not in the Bible. Why? Because Jesus said, I will build my church. You know, he's never changed that. He said, I will build my church. Isn't that great? <laughs> Jesus will build the church if we just get out of the way and give him a chance. He can do it, and he will do it. Now, Jeremiah challenged the clergy of his day 
with the following statements from Jeremiah 2. If you want to open your Bibles to Jeremiah 2, I'm going to read two verses here eventually. Verse 8 and verse 13. I still remember the day this verse really hit me. His challenge begins like this in verse 8. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Isn't that something? The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. The spiritual leaders of Jeremiah's day were willing to go on with all the religious trappings and rituals without the manifest presence of God. They did not say, where is the Lord? I want... <laughs> I say, where's the Lord? <laughs> I'm not going to do this without God. I can't do this without God. I want the manifest presence of God. I want to see him work. I want to know his presence. I want to see hardened sinners get broken and saved. Amen? I want to know that God is with me, that he is here. I love what you have up here. God with us. <laughs> Oh, may he be with us. And these leaders of the church of that day did not, did not ask, where is the Lord? He was not there. He had left their presence. He had left the temple. They knew all the right things to do. In fact, they did all the things God said to do. They had church. They did all their programs, all their rituals, offered all their sacrifices, did everything that God had said to do. But the manifest presence of God was not there. Wow. And nobody asked, where is the Lord? And I see that everywhere where today. I don't mean every church, but in the evangelical church today, we can go on with all the stuff, you know. We know all the right things to do. And we can do it all. Without him. How sad. And so there stands the question, where is the Lord? Then they studied and taught the word of God without knowing the God of the word. You can do that too, you know. You can teach Sunday school class all your life and not really know God. Not really have him in it. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me, said Jesus. But you will not come to me <laughs> that you might have life. What's the point of the word of God? It's to get to God, right? It's to come to Christ. It's to know him. It's to have him filling your heart and life. That's what it's about. The real Living presence of God. Well, the leaders also were living worldly, even sinful lives. I have a sermon on this. Love not the world. Huh? <laughs> Love not the world. Christians today... Now, I know after I say this, you're not going to come to the revival conference. <laughs> Christians today are worldly. They love the world. God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, but he who does the will of God abides forever. But I want to tell you that God's people today love the world very, very much. And God has something to say about it. Barna, and I don't know if Barna's always right, but he 
studies the church of today, he says that 40% of our pastors are into pornography. I don't know if that's true, but uh, (laughs) if it's any percent, it ought not to be true, right? Right? (laughs) I don't ask questions without wanting an answer. If I ask a question, you can answer me. They're never trick questions. (laughs) Also, he said they're trying to mix the work of God with the philosophies, religious concepts, and methods drawn from the culture around them. Cultural adaptation has become overwhelming in the evangelical church. And the offense of the cross has ceased. You say, people won't like the cross. Of course not. So as Paul said, the offense of the cross has ceased. And we brazenly contradict the word of God which says, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, Beware lest any cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him. God is enough. (laughs) We don't need, we don't need what the world thinks. You believe this, don't you? (laughs) Don't you? Come on. Wake up. (laughs) Do you or don't you? Do you believe it? Of course you do. (laughs) Of course you do. And I want to say to you this morning that God is enough. And we don't need the things of the world to help the church or to attract people into the church, or to get them to come to listen to us. What we need is the presence of God. Man, I've been in revival where people came in, as soon as they walked in the door, they were totally quiet. And they walked up, and they filled the front row, and then they filled the next row, and then they filled the next row, and then they filled the next row, and there was only room for 250, and there were 900 people there. And there was nothing. There was nothing to attract them. You say, why did they come? Because God was there. (laughs) You just get God there. (laughs) Watch him come. You don't have to put on some (laughs) crazy thing to try to attract people to come to to meet with the people of God. People are attracted by the presence of God. Absolutely. I got so tickled when I first came to Regina. And I did pastor in Canada for 29 years, so I'm basically a Canadian. (laughs) And I love Canada. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If my foolish son didn't live in the United States, I'd be... (laughs) I'd be living in Canada. <clears throat> Paul said, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. (laughs) That comes from the presence of God. Jeremiah sums it up in verse 13 when he says, My people have committed two evils. And I think you could take this verse and put it right down over the church today. And it may not fit this church, (laughs) but... But I've been around, folks, and it fits the evangelical church. My people have committed two evils. 
They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. <laughs> Are you thirsty? <laughs> you need a drink from Jesus. Well, <laughs> oh my. Cisterns that we have created in the church to try to give people a drink. And they're broken and they have mud in them and pollywogs. <laughs> they're a mess. But the fountain of Christ has never changed. It is full of living water. And so God wants to call his people back. Human substitutes for the manifest presence and power of God. The greatest need of the hour is the manifest presence of God himself in my life and my ministry. And in the church. I still remember the Sunday morning when there was no crusade. There was no evangelist, and suddenly God came in to the sanctuary. You say, well, you don't know your theology. God is everywhere. <laughs> I know that. But I tell you, <laughs> there's a difference. And God just filled the place. And God wants to do that. He wants to come and make himself known and be manifest in our midst. Spiritual movements have a tendency to drift. You know, spiritual movements such as the Nazarene Church and the Christian Missionary Alliance and many others, they start off with a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. I mean, they start off with the fullness of God. And he is on them. And he anoints them. And they have power. And people are attracted to the presence of God. And they come. And they get saved. And they get cleansed. And they get sanctified. You still believe in sanctification? <laughs> and they get sanctified. And filled with the Holy Spirit. And they get on fire. What happens? <laughs> well, their children have some of it, but not as much. <laughs> and then their children have a little less. And then finally, slowly, as the power and the anointing and the blessing are waning, we try to start substituting it with something that will keep things going. See, I told you after I get through, you won't want to come to the rest of the meeting because it's going to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying to leaders in the Christian Missionary Alliance, because now God has, has put this on me, <clears throat> We have got to get back to the presence of God. We need him. We need him. In his book, Preacher and Prayer, E.M. Bounds has said, We are constantly on a stretch, if not on a strain, to devise, and I'm quoting, new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man or the woman and sink the man in the plan or organization. God's plan is to make much of the man far more of him than of anything else. Men and women are God's method. Right? Have you read the Bible? <laughs> He never, he never uses uh, an organization or, pardon me, I had committees in my church, okay, <laughs> or committees. <laughs> he uses people. 
He uses men and women that he can get a hold of. And he hasn't changed. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better people. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That dispensation that heralded the coming of Christ was thrust into the world with a man. He was a queer one, too. <laughs> he wore camel's hair and ate honey and locusts. I could stand the honey, but locusts? <laughs> Please. <laughs> I hope he roasted them. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in some countries where they eat them, but uh, <laughs> when God declares that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him, he declares the necessity of man and his dependence on them. God is looking for people who want him and who love him and who seek him and who pray and weep and cry out to God. Oh, God, come and fill my life. I can't stand to try to do this without you. And that's what God's looking for. And I tell you, I want to stand with Elisha and take up the mantle of the spiritual giants who have gone before us and cry out to the heavens, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And I want the waters to part and the fire to fall, and I'm not going to go on with church without it. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So I have to ask myself, so is that power upon me? Is that anointing upon me? So it really is self for Christ. A life that's either centered in self or centered in Christ. And I have to get there by the way of the cross. And I want to tell you, Somebody says, oh my, I'd love to be in a revival like they had in the early 70s in Canada. Well, I tell you, it'll cost blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> because there's only one way to get there, and that's a cross. The death of self and the life of Christ. And it's the dying that's hard. It's the giving up what I want <laughs> and what I believe and what I have as my ambition and what I'd like to see and coming to the end of ourselves. And that's why Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must disown himself and take up the cross and follow me. And that disowning of self, that's giving up all my rights and all my possessions and all my work and everything giving it up totally and laying it on the altar before God. That, that death, and it's very real. That will bring us into the place where we believe God is enough, and he will be. He will be enough. His power, his grace will be enough. Many years ago, it's been so long now, I don't have any idea when, when they had black and white television, so that was back in Noah's time. You understand that. <laughs> and I saw this program on television about a cowboy who was the fast gun in the West. And what happened is that he, he had a, a problem, and he went to a doctor of that day, and they didn't, weren't all that good then, and this doctor told him he would be dead in six months. Well, he was going to die in six months. So, since he already had the sentence of death, he acted with great daring and appeared to have nerves of steel. He went out with his six-gun and started catching all the outlaws, everybody, because he was going to die anyway shortly, and it didn't matter. And then after a while, he saw another doctor in a bigger city, and he examined him and said, no, 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 
With just a little treatment, you can live into old age. And now that he no longer had the sentence of death on him, he hung up his gun <laughs> because he didn't have the sentence of death. Well, you see, once you have the sentence of death at the cross of Calvary and you give it up, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You're ready to do whatever he says. You're ready to give your life away. And so God is calling us to that. Pastor Ton of Romania, he was pastor of Second Baptist Church in Areta, Romania, until he was exiled by the Romanian government in 1981. In pastoral renewal, he writes of his experience. He said, years ago, I ran away from my country to study theology at Oxford. In 1972, when I was ready to go back to Romania, I discussed my plans with some fellow students. They pointed out that I might be arrested at the border. One student asked, Joseph, what chances do you have of successful successfully implementing your plans. Tan asked God about it, and God brought to mind Matthew 10, 16, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves, and seemed to say, tell me, what chance does a sheep surrounded by wolves have of surviving five minutes, let alone converting the wolves? <laughs> Joseph, that's how I send you, totally defenseless, and without a reasonable hope of success. If you are willing to go like that, go. If you are not willing to be in that position, don't go. Tan writes, after our return, as I preached uninhibitedly, harassment and arrest came. One day during interrogation, an officer threatened to kill me. Then I said, and I love this, <laughs> I just this, I love this. I said, sir, your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. <laughs> sir, you know my sermons are all over the country on tapes now. If you kill me, I will be sprinkling them with my blood. Whoever listens to them after that will say, I better listen. This man sealed it with his blood. They will speak ten times louder than before. So go on, kill me, I win the supreme victory then. <laughs> the officer sent me home. <laughs> that gave me pause. For years I was a Christian who was cautious because I wanted to survive. I had accepted all the restrictions the authorities put on me because I wanted to live. Now I wanted to die and they wouldn't oblige. Now I could do whatever I wanted in Romania. For years I wanted to save my life and I was losing it. Now that I wanted to lose it, I was winning it. Amen? <laughs> Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, For we do not wish you to be ignorant, brethren, as to our tribulation which happened to us in Asia, that we were excessively pressed beyond our power so as to despair even of life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. <laughs> amen? amen? I said amen? amen. Uh, good, I know your way. Hmm. When I was a young pastor, God brought me to a death experience. I got fired. <laughs> I had gone to Bible college, and I grew up in a pastor's home, and I, went, I was saved and called to preach, and I went to Bible college, and I was pastoring a little church, and one day the board called me in and fired me. And you say, I don't blame them. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> but, I, you know, it just killed me. I was just devastated. I just said, I said to my wife, well, I guess I made a mistake. I guess God didn't call me to preach, you know? I guess somehow it was my own idea, and I just can't do this. And I went to God, and I said, I can't do this. I guess I made a mistake. 
I just should quit the ministry for good. And God said, good. This is where I had to get you. I had to get you to the end of yourself. I had to bring you to the end of yourself, where you could die, where you could give it up and decide you couldn't do it. (laughs) And then he could do it. Oh, my friends, God wants to bring us to that end of ourselves and that surrender and that fullness of his spirit where the presence and power of God is in our life. That's what he wants. Dr. A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, said, and I quote, I look back with unutterable gratitude to the lonely and sorrowful night when mistaken in many things and imperfect in all, and not knowing but that it would be death in the most literal sense before morning. My heart's first full consecration was made, and with unreserved surrender, I first could say, Jesus, I my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken, thou my all from hence shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've thought or hoped or known. But how rich is my condition, God is mine, and heaven's my home. Amen. (laughs) Oh, that's where God wants to bring us. That's what he wants to do for us. Well, hmm. I can only preach one sermon, so I've got to not preach everything. (laughs) I would like to just give you a great sermon on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I can't do that. <clears throat> I'll get shot. <laughs> Not that that would matter particularly. <laughs> it wouldn't be much loss, would it, Lord? Mm. D.L. Moody's testimony, it's for, I'm giving a very short version. He said, I was crying all the time that God would fill me with his spirit. Well, one day in the city of New York, oh, what a day. I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience to name. I can only say that God revealed himself to me. And I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths, yet hundreds were converted. I would not now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience. If you should give me all the world, it would be as the small dust of the balance. Dr. F.B. Meyer was a great radio preacher when I was young, and he was attending a Keswick conference. And these are his words, very short testimony. I left the prayer meeting and crept out into the lane away from town. As I walked, I said, oh, my God, if there is a man who needs the power of the Holy Ghost to rest upon him, it is I. But I do not know how to receive him. I am too tired, too worn, too nervously down to agonize. A voice said to me, as you took forgiveness from the hand of the dying Christ, Take the Holy Ghost from the hand of the living Christ. I turned to Christ and said, As I breathe in this whiff of warm night air, so I breathe into every part of me thy blessed spirit. I felt no hand upon my head. There was no lambent flame. There was no rushing sound from heaven. But by faith, without emotion, without excitement, I took and took for the first time and I have kept on taking ever since. I was a young pastor getting ready for ordination, and I knew that within uh, two days I would be, my wife and I would be driving to the place where they were gonna have the district conference and I would be examined for ordination. I had read all the books and written all the papers and you know, done all of that. 
Now there would be a two-hour uh, oral examination. I knew one question they would ask was, have you been filled, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? I knew I was not, and that I was not going to lie. And I had been praying and crying out to God. I had surrendered everything as far as I knew. And we were in bed. My wife was asleep. It was about 2 in the morning. She was sleeping by my side. I was desperate, deeply disturbed. I said, oh, God, you have to do something for me. And it seemed to me that Christ said, just reach out by faith and take the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Just receive him by faith. And I said, is that possible? And God said, yes. So I'll never forget it. Laying there in the dark, my wife breathing quietly beside me. And I said, Holy Spirit, I receive you. And again, there was no flash of lightning. There was no thunder from heaven. <laughs> but I tell you what, the Holy Spirit filled me. And I knew it. And he has filled me many times since. And I just want to encourage you this morning that God is enough. God is enough. <laughs> oh, my. I could take all day telling you of the power of God. He is enough. He is enough. You say we like to see people constantly saved. Pastor of church said for five years we had an average of two conversions a week. You say, how, how God, <laughs> God, <laughs> just God. I have a friend right now. Uh, they started a new church. He and a, another friend started a new church in the south of Cleveland. First, they started it in a home, and they prayed, and then they, they went to a school, and, and they prayed, and then there was a empty church building and they bought it they've been in there about six months he called me on the phone shortly before I came on this trip and uh, he said uh, Dick uh, I, I'm calling you because I need some advice of course afterwards I found out he didn't but he said I need some advice I said what's happening he said oh people are getting saved so fast and you know I'm an administrator at heart and I feel like I have to do something and my wife said no and I <laughs> <laughs> and I called you to see. <laughs> I said, well, tell me about it. Oh, he said, we are now, after six months, we're running 400 in our morning service. And he said, this past Sunday, we had 80 first-time visitors, and people are getting saved so fast, we don't know what to do with them. I said, what are you doing? He said, nothing but pray. And then he told me about the prayer meeting. He said, we have white-knuckle prayer meetings. Oh, <laughs> I said, tell me what about your white knuckle prayer meeting. He said, the people are coming together and they're praying and they're crying out to God and they're weeping and they're sobbing before God, crying out to God to save their family and their neighbors and their friends and they won't let go. He said, recently we had 100 people at our prayer meeting. I'm talking about a brand new church. He said, I feel like I have to do something. I said, no, keep your sticky fingers off from it. <laughs> God is at work, let him work. Amen. <laughs> Don't get in the way. He, he's a great preacher. He's a great preacher. He said, I'm just preaching. He said, the, not, no great sermons. He said, I'm just preaching simple gospel sermons, how to get saved. And I said, that's fine. Just do that <laughs> and pray. He said, we're not doing anything else. We're not doing anything to attract the people. And they're just swarming in all kinds of people and getting saved. And there's only one answer. They are praying. They are pleading. They are crying out to God. They decided that only God could do this. They're desperate. Only God could do it. And he is doing it. Amen. 
Well, I went to preach in Lima. They had a church of 170 that grew to 25,000 in 20 years. And they had some kind of special thing they did of preaching and different stuff. And, and uh, I thought, nah, that's not it. <laughs> so I nosed around. I found an elderly woman missionary who had been there from the beginning. I said, tell me, was there any prayer involved in this? Oh, yes, yeah, she said, of course there was. I said, tell me, tell me. Well, she said, we started having all-night prayer meetings. Oh, wonderful. I said, did they pray all night? She said, oh, yeah, crying out to God for souls. She said, we got to where we were having 800 people praying all night. You think God could stand that? <laughs> he could stand it. <laughs> 800 people weeping and praying and crying to God. I tell you what. I was there, and in those churches, if somebody didn't get saved every Sunday, they wouldn't go home. They sat there, and they started weeping and crying and asking God why and confessing sin and pleading with God for souls. See, that's getting God back in the picture. <laughs> that's getting him back in the picture. Is God enough? Yes, he is. Absolutely. I don't know what your problem is this morning. I don't know what your heartache is. I don't know what your burden is. I know God is enough. He can save. He can heal. He can change. He can provide. He can do whatever. He is enough. Let us bow in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful congregation this morning, this group of people who love you, this dear pastor who loves you and is committed to you. I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful group of your people. And I pray that the truth of your word this morning will not be allowed to leave even one heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Sifley. God's spoken to us this morning. God is enough. And uh, you need to know that. I need to know that. God is enough. If following the service this morning, uh, you would like to uh, meet here at the front for prayer, we'd be happy to, uh, to pray with you. Whatever you're facing in your life, to know that God is enough, we'd invite you to come and we'd 